In this episode, we'll be talking about the difference between services and experiences. We'll be talking about the end of marketing as we know it. And finally, who is the chief experience officer and why do we need them in the first place? If you're interested in these topics, stay tuned and here's the guest for this episode. Hi, I'm Joe Pine and this is the Service Design Show. If you're trying to design services that have a positive impact on people's lives and are good for business, then you've come to the right place. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to the Service Design Show. My guest in this episode is Joe Pine. Joe is a world-renowned author and management advisor who has spoken at the World Economic Forum, the TED Conference and CES. Things he loves in life are golf and cigars, and according to Joe, these two things go hand in hand together. In this episode, we'll announce how you can win a signed copy of the Experience Economy, an absolute industry classic book co-written by Joe. And in the next 30 minutes, Joe and I will be talking about the differences between services and experiences. We'll be talking about the end of marketing as we know it. And finally, we'll be talking about Who's the chief experience officer and why do we need these people in the first place? We post new videos on this channel on a weekly basis, so if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. And if you'd like to learn how to explain what service design is without making it sound like brain surgery, make sure you check out the free course I've got for you. Click the link here or check the description of this episode. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's jump straight into the interview with Joe. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've met in Amsterdam many, many, many years ago during a completely different uh, conference, the Mobile Monday Amsterdam, no, 2007 or something like that. Do you remember? <laughs> I don't know. Must have been. Yeah, it was it was a long time ago. I, I went to, to at least two or three of the Mobile Mondays. I remember uh, one at the um, um, uh, the Red House, the Rode yeah, Rode Hood. Yeah, Rode Hood. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's you know it's it's super nice to have you this time in a completely different context here on the Service Design Show, and I have so many questions for you. Um, you're, you're, uh, when we were in touch, I already told you that uh, you sort of inspired me to go into this field in the first place. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, again, it's my honor. Uh, I, I'm, I'm already starting to blush here. So let, let's just move on <laughs> into the, uh, well, yeah, into the show. Well, that's so, very high nice praise, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, um, I'm, you're not a service designer per se, but uh, I'm really curious if you uh, recall your very first memory of service design. When did you hear, hear about the term? Well, I'll, I'll, I'm not sure we used that exact term, but I'll mention you know, back in 1990, uh, IBM sent me to MIT for a year to get my master's degree. And it's where I started writing my first book on mass customization. I basically did it as my thesis. Uh, at MIT and then worked it into a full book when I, when I got out. And one of the things that I noticed in that entire class, so we had a cohort of about 45 people that, that spent the, you know, most of that one year together. So we got a you know, master's degree in a concentrated amount of time. And most all of the examples that the professors talked about were manufacturing examples. Uh, and it was just sort of constant, all this manufacturing. And finally, with the head of the program there and, and giving a manufacturing example, I sort of finally got time, uh, got tired of it. You know, I raised my hand. And I said, well, you know, look at uh, all you do is talk about manufacturing examples when there's so many people here that are in the service business or in, in my case, in a service part of a manufacturing company, IBM at the time. And I had everybody raise their hand. I said, OK, how many people here are actually more concerned about services than manufacturing? And it was over half of the class. Yeah. You know, it opened yeah. up their eyes. And, and I think that's when it first sort of struck me that we really had shifted from an industrial economy to a service economy. And so, therefore, we need to think about service design, not just mm. industrial design. Yeah, makes complete sense. Makes complete sense. Um, we talked about Amsterdam uh, a second ago. Uh, 
if people are watching this episode in uh, the very first week that it's uh, out, um, there's also, you'll be in Amsterdam to actually present a masterclass, right? What, what's that about? Really, can you, can you share really briefly what people can expect at this masterclass? Sure, sure. The, the masterclass will be April, April 26th in uh, Hofdorp. Yeah. Uh, at the Office of Performance Solutions, which is a, a longtime friend of mine, Andre Viringa. And uh, they do a great job at training companies to, to stage great experiences, particularly frontline personnel. And Andre uh, wrote uh, this book on reverse thinking a, uh, a few years ago, or maybe a year ago. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so we're sort of combining our, our concepts. I'm working on a new concept on going from marketing to customering, which is really reversing things. So we're calling it reverse customering, and, and I'm going to spend uh, a great amount of time talking about my ideas, uh, Andre on his ideas, and I think they really mesh together very well. And then we're going to do a lot of interactions to help people to embrace these ideas and figure out then what they can uh, do about them in their own companies. Mm. And I'll put all the relevant links down below in the description of this episode. So if people are fast, sure. they can still hopefully sign up. I hope that there are still tickets left. And uh, maybe if they take uh, one of your books to, uh, to the masterclass, uh, you'll be able to sign them for them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Always happy to sign a book. And I hope to, hope to see people there at the, at the masterclass. All right. Joe, time is flying by, so let's just dive <laughs> into the topics uh, that you've sent me. And I have so many questions related to them. You have a stack of question starters. I have a stack of uh, yep. topics. Are you ready to start? Absolutely. All right. I would say that the first topic is a classic one. Let's, um, let's start with this one. It's called services versus experiences. Do you have a question starter that goes along with this topic? Uh, services versus ex experiences. I think the, uh, the, the best one to do is to use your, <laughs> your wild card, All right. your ellipsis. And, to, and ask the question, what is the difference, right? What is the difference between services and experiences? And it's mm. a crucial thing for people to understand um, that, you know, and I'll go back a little further than that, just mentioned that, you know, we've gone, I already mentioned industrial and service economy. It really began with the agrarian economy based off commodities as the primary economic offering. Then we shifted into industrial economy based off of goods as the primary economic offering. The latter half of the 20th century is when we shifted into the into services as the primary economic offering, and and today what we're doing is we're, we've shifted into an experience economy where experiences have become the the predominant economic offering. That experiences are what consumers and even increasingly businesses are looking for. So so therefore people need to shift from making goods and delivering services to staging experiences. And that's part of the key distinctions between them. You know, services are intangible activities performed on behalf of an individual person, but experiences are not just intangible, they're memorable. That you have to create a memory inside of people. Uh, services are customized, right, done just for that individual person, but experiences are in fact inherently personal. That no two people have the same experience, even if they're in the same place at the same time, because of who they are, because of the, the, the experiences that they had before that that primed them for this, uh, because of their mood that day, all of these things means they have a different experience. So you need to reach inside of them uh, and engage them uh, with, a, with that, that memorable experience, you know, again, creating that, that memory uh, inside of them. And uh, uh, you know, there, there are other distinctions we could talk about. And the, the, the key one, I think, today I've learned is really about time. It's about time, that, that services are about time well saved. You know, that, that let's get in and out, uh, let's, let's be convenient, let's save my time. And by the way, people want goods and services both to be commoditized so they can buy them at the lowest possible price, the greatest possible convenience, so that consumers can save their, their hard-earned money and their hard-earned time to spend them on the experiences that they value. And so experiences are really about time well spent that people value the time that they spend in there versus just wanting to, to get in and out. And so therefore, the, the, the requirements for service design are very different than they are for experience design because experience design is really about designing time, designing the time that your customers spend with you. Hmm. <clears throat> I, I hope that a lot of people watching and listening to this episode already know 
uh, uh, this framework and I'm sort of curious, you know, I, I'm a service designer. Um, am I sort of becoming obsolete or maybe, <laughs> maybe the, the, the question that was on my mind when I was thinking about this topic, how does this uh, actually um, um, impact me as a practitioner? So I'm a service designer. Uh, the distinction between services and experiences, what does that mean for me in practice? Well, well, first understand that services aren't going away any more than goods and uh, commodities. It's just going to take fewer and fewer people to be able to, to produce them uh, over time. They'll get more and more automated and jobs and growth and, 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 and gross domestic product are shifting to experiences. But then also realize that experiences are built on top of services, which are built on top of goods and goods on top of, of commodities, the raw materials that begin it all. So even when you design an experience, you still, still need to design services in order to enable that experience. And that's where uh, you know, many techniques of service design can still uh, be appropriate. Uh, think about uh, you know, uh, the Walt Disney Company, for example. You, you go into a Walt Disney theme park and you have a wonderful experience with all the attractions. But there's still parking services. There's still food services. Mm. Um, there's still mm. photographic services. And even to think about waiting in line, you know, the, the, the experience of, of going into an attraction at Walt Disney is about time well spent, that I, that I enjoy that ride that I'm going on. But then there's the waiting in line in front of it, right? That is pure service. That's just getting from, from the outside to the inside and, and getting on that ride. So you can do service design techniques to be able to do that. Or you could also think about, well, how do I turn that service into an experience? You know, Disney first did that by snaking the line so that you could do a lot of people watching and then by turning the waiting into a pre-show for the live experience. But still, you know, that, that, that's good for about five minutes. That's not good for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And so they then use more service design techniques to come up with fast pass hmm. where fast hmm. pass allows you to, to go off and do something else and not wait in line and then come just five minutes before your time to to um, uh, get on the ride. So you can see how services and experiences can work together. You you talk to so many companies, you see so many case studies. Um, what have you found that is the biggest challenge for companies that want to make the cultural mental shift from service <laughs> thinking to experience thinking? What is the biggest challenge in there? Well, you actually sort of identified the, the, the answer in the question. The biggest challenge is, in fact, mindset. That people have the right mindset, that, that they understand what business they're in in particular. Then being in the experience business is different than being in the service business. In the service business, you want to spend as little time as possible with customers because they're costing you money. With the experience business, you understand that that's the value that you're, in fact, bringing, is that they're enjoying that time uh, that they spend with you. Uh, services are, again, about delivering our activities. So it's really focused uh, internally on what we do and the activities that we um, execute in order to create the value for customers. With experiences, the focus is on them. The focus is on the consumer and, and the, what I call the guest of the experience. You know, services have clients, experiences have guests. And so how do we host them as a guest? How do we get them to, to, to spend their time? How do we design time again for uh, each individual guest that we have in there. And it all begins with that mindset of what business are we really in. Yeah, and making that, that decision. Are we a service company or are we an experience company? Exactly. And, and, you, and you can do both, right? Mm -hmm. It is possible to do both, provide your good services uh, and experiences, but at least know for this offering, for this interaction with customers, which one is it? So um, sort of <coughs> the final thing regarding this topic, Let's take a really uh, common company like an airline. Do you perceive that as a, wh wh how do you perceive an airline? <laughs> Poorly for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, they are, they're, they're obviously in the service business of getting people from point A to point B. Um, but, uh, you know, in fact, the first, the very first publication anywhere of the term experience economy you know, which I discovered, or I, well, I coined after discovering it uh, in late 93 or early 1994. So, you know, we're talking almost 25 years ago. Actually, it was 25 years ago, yeah, almost. Yeah. And um, um, there was an article in the Harvard Business Review where they did an interview with Sir Colin Marshall, who was the head of British Airways. And he talked in there about how 
uh, how an airline should not be just a cattle car, should not be just getting people from point A to point B. It should be an experience. And I wrote a letter to the editor that they published where I talked about, yes, that's because we're shifting into an experience economy. You know, but over 20 years later, have airlines really learned? Well, not for the normal traveler. You know, you do have exceptions. You've got the, you know, the Singapore Airlines and the Emirates uh, Airlines, you know, sort of the, the particularly for their first class. But uh, even for uh, uh, for those in coach, they do uptick that to where it may le- rise to level experiences. First class has always been an experience, hmm. but it's, you know, it's hugely expensive, you know, sometimes an order of magnitude more than what you pay in coach. But for most airlines, for most customers, it's just still a, a cattle car. Okay, let's let's leave it with that quote uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the end, and move into uh, the second topic. And the second right. topic uh, is sort of a preview, or uh, maybe looking back, depending on when you're watching this episode on your masterclass. And it's from marketing to customering, a new topic for me. So, do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Sure. Well, well, the question might be, how can we move from marketing to customer? How can we understand the distinctions between uh, marketing and uh, customering? Customering is a new word. So let's start with yeah. that. What is it? Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's actually a word uh, coined uh, uh, by my uh, partner uh, and co-author of The Experience Economy. And, and as soon as he, he mentioned it, I glommed onto it. That, that, and, and the reason is, if you think about it, is that there are no markets. There are only customers. You know, markets as commonly conceived of in, in business simply do not exist. They're a convenient fiction masking the fact that we don't know who our customers really are. You know, on and an a individual level. That's right, on the individual level. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, but that's my point is that customers are only on the individual level. Right? They are only individuals. They are never a market or a segment or a niche or a generation or a persona or any other agglomeration of anonymous buying units. A, a customer is a living, breathing individual person. Or if you're selling to businesses, a customer is a um, active, corporeal, individual enterprise. And we must therefore ascend to the proposition that every customer is unique. Every customer is undeniably, unremittingly, unalterably unique. And therefore, we have to stop marketing and start customering. I think you scare a lot of people by saying <laughs> this. Um, trying to understand, I, I think we all try to understand well, customers on a personal level. But mar- yeah, like you said, markets are a convenient way to think about it. But, but my question was, customering, how does that scale? Yeah, yeah. Well, the customers can, it can scale because of technology today. Because we have the technology to interact with with millions and billions of customers on an individual basis over the Internet, through our phones. We can identify who they are. Uh, We can understand their individual wants and needs. We can learn from them and therefore do things differently for them. You know, one of the key distinctions um, with with customering and and, and other things you can look at that at least you like targeting. Right. Because people say they want to target individual customers. But they target to better sell what they've already produced. Yeah, a yeah, key yeah. customer is that we actually change our offering in response to to what we learn. You know, and I'll I'll, um, I'll give you one of the best examples, which is a a, uh, a client of mine, uh, which is Carnival Corporation. And Carnival Corporation, they announced at the Consumer Electronics Show last year, and they've now implemented or ramping it up, first in the Princess Cruise brand and then other brands, where when you go online and book a cruise. Right. They want to know you as an individual. So they ask you to 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 upload your passport. So they have your picture. They have your identity, your, your, your information that they need You know when you're going through international waters. Uh, and then they um, send you and what they call an ocean medallion. And this is an example of an ocean medallion. It's an IOT device It's about the size of a, of a U.S. quarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this now allows them to identify you wherever you are in the ship. When you, when you uh, embark onto the ship, you don't have to wait in line and show your passport three times in that. Instead, you just sort of walk at a, at a you know, slow pace online, not really having to stop. And every time you get near a crew member, your picture and your name pops up, as well as your verification that they have the passport uh, information. 
uh, and then it, it pops up on their tablet, and they just say, you know, welcome, you know, Mr. Fontaine, uh, please go ahead. And so uh, you get on there, and once you're there, you have this in your pocket or on a on a uh, med, on a pendant or on your wrist, wrist, excuse me. Uh, then as you walk up to your stateroom, it has seven to 8,000 sensors in every ship. They're identifying exactly where you are. They see you approaching your stateroom. And then just as your hand touches the, the door handle, complete the electric circuit, it opens just for you. You can pay for anything with it. And then they identify you as an individual customer. You can order anything from anywhere, and it, they'll deliver to you wherever you happen to be. They learn about your context. So they'll learn, for example, that when you're on the pool deck with your kids, your favorite drink is an iced tea. When you're in the bar with your buddies, it's a mojito. And when, when you're in the, the restaurant with your wife, uh, it's a glass of Shiraz. Right. So same person, understand your individual preferences. And they basically morph the entire ship around you, giving you personal uh, experience invitations. So that you create they again, designing time so that you create a, um, a mass customized itinerary for each individual person and family and other group uh, on, on the ship. It's, it's pure customering. <clears throat> and you, you mentioned it. It's, it's like mass customization all over, but then on personal level, right? on, our, on our interaction right, right. It level. Is, it, yeah, it is an extension of my original ideas on mass customization, which are more operational and product and getting into all well, the dialogue with customers and understanding them individually and extending that uh, even to you know how we understand the context of each individual customer that we have. So for me, this is a pretty new concept. I, I can imagine you also have some uh, questions regarding to this. What, what, what are the things that you're still trying to figure out relating to customering? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how I've, I've got a number of principles and how all the principles interrelate, you know, and how much of it do you have to do to really sort of call it uh, customering, mm. you know, are, are, are some key things. And, and obviously, you know, one of the issues is, you know, I've, I've for a long time, you know, a lot of it's vocabulary, right? You really have to change vocabulary. You have to stop talking about marketing, start talking about customer, right? So then, well, can I say things like, well, you were a marketer, now you're a customer -er, -er. <laughs> you know, customer -er, I guess it would be. You know, there, there's some issues with vocabulary and how, to, how do we really make things parallel and definitions of that. So those are the sort of things I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, write it as a full book uh, and, then, and have that published in the next year or, or, or right, two. That's, I, don't, I don't know if that's a preview, but at least it's out there right now. <laughs> um, a different question I had re regarding to this, it sort of feels like um, marketing is what the big corporations do. Smaller businesses, your local coffee shop, they're already doing this, right? Or are you still? <clears throat> yeah, yeah there, there certainly are many small businesses who know the customers by name, you know, that they, they, they walk in, they greet them by name, uh, they know what their standard orders are, they know exactly. what their preferences exactly. are and so forth. But, uh, and so, yes, they do practice customering. It's sort of craft customering, and we do need mass customering. We do, do need many companies to do that at scale. Exactly. And again, we, we can know who they are. They carry around a device with them uh, that identifies who they are. You know, there, there are companies like Neiman Marcus, the, the, the department store, for example, where if you have the Neiman Marcus app on in your phone, when you cross the threshold of the store, bing, they identify who you are. They can send an alert to your favorite sales associate that's identified in the system. They know your color choices, your style choices. They know what you've purchased before. They can send you a message, say, hey, I'm over here in the department. Would love to see you. I've, uh, you know, I, I know exactly what, uh, you know, this new, new dress that we have in that would be perfect for you and, and that sort of thing. So you, now you're providing that to every salesperson, even though they can't remember the, the thousands of people go, going through there. Whereas a local store owner might be be able to remember tens or, or scores yeah. or, or yeah. even hundreds. One of the questions I have regarding to this, but uh, we won't get to answer it in this episode, is uh, I guess trust is a crucial element in this aspect. Sharing uh, all these preferences with sort of big entities who you don't know. Uh, sure, sure. Right. That that. I, I guess trust is, a, is really a key element to actually making this happen. 
Right. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, just got grilled in Congress uh, yesterday. And I think again today he's getting that because of the issues of them sharing information that really should be private. You know, Carnival, when they do this, they ensure you that your information will remain private. In fact, if you lose this, there's actually zero identification on this. All it is is a, a, a number. number. And yeah. that number identifies to you. And that, that's in their shipboard cloud uh, that they have. So you lose it. There's no possibility of there being a, a data breach uh, based off of that. And you've got to guarantee customers that you keep the private information private, uh, that you won't sell it to others. But why does Facebook sell it? Because Facebook has the wrong business model. Facebook business model is where their users are the product and they're selling the information about that product, those users, to advertisers. And when you go shift from marketing to customer, you got to stop advertising. Exactly. You know, advertising is, is just targeting people to sell them stuff you've already done. Instead, you need to get into a conversation with them. It needs to be a two-way conversation where every interaction you have with them is an opportunity to learn. Hmm. And because you learn about them, you can better customize your offerings, right? Now, again, not just the stuff we already have on the shelf, but better customize your offerings to them. Because you do that, they're going to benefit. And because they benefit, they're willing to interact with you again. And so you get this very tight learning relationship that grows and deepens with each customer uh, over time. And that's how we create brand loyalty. That's how we, we get our customers to want to, to uh, come back to us whenever they're in the market. You know, and I think that's an appropriate use of the term market, right? The place where buyers and sellers come together, whenever in the market for something that you can provide, they're going to come back to you. Once you've gone through this process on Carnival, you're not going to go to another cruise company because Carnival already knows so much about you and they're keeping and they're keeping it safe and they're using it to benefit you. No one else, just you. It becomes a pull instead of a push mechanism. Exactly. Right? That's one that's one of the chapters. That's one of the principles. Is go from push to pull. Right? Quit pushing your stuff on customers and instead pull information from them. Final topic, Joe, for at least this episode. Um, it's the topic that has been uh, on the show uh, recently, but uh, I'm sure we can say something new about this. And this topic is the chief experience officer position, the position of the chief experience officer. A question started that goes along with this one. Well, that was that was easy. Who are chief experience officers? Anyway. Who are chief experience officers? It's actually a position that we've been promoting for over a decade um, because as we shift into the experience economy, it's very clear that that often companies need that concerted focus on it. You know, maybe eventually we get to the point where you don't need one. Like, you know, I, I don't imagine the Walt Disney Company needing a chief experience officer because everybody recognizes that they're in the experience business. But for those companies that are shifting into it, it's a great way uh, to be able to focus on how do we stage great, engaging, compelling, personal, uh, and memorable experiences for each one of our individual customers. So, in fact, uh, we wrote an article for the American Management Association, its quarterly journal that excuse me, came out this winter, and it was on the roles of the chief experience officer. And so I talked to a number of CXOs, many of them our own uh, certified experience economy experts, uh, and about their jobs and what they're doing. And we came up with a framework, uh, really a two-by-two two matrix that identifies the four roles of the CXO. And it's based on the uh, operations of the company versus its offerings, right? Uh, uh, an internal and an external focus. And then also, again, on the company and its customers. Again, internal, external. So the, the key four roles, and I won't outline the whole two-by-two, two, but basically is that you need to be a catalyst. You need to be a catalyst internally. Uh, to change operations and focus uh, on experience staging. You need to be a designer, right? So here exactly is, you know, again, service design versus experience design. You need to be an experienced designer to help create those offerings that are going to um, uh, pull together the capabilities of the company. You need to be an orchestrator where you basically are taking the operations and orchestrating them out towards the customer uh, uh, and helping pull all of the elements together to be able to do that. And then you need to be a champion. You need to be a champion for the customer inside of the company uh, to say that we need to focus on this customer and we need to create a great experience for each one of these individual ones. And then actually, so the two-by-two two defines these four roles, but there's a fifth role that, 
that I came to realize was very important, and that's that of a guide. Because if you're changing from a, a service um, um, mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. provider to an experienced stager, you really that that's a transformation in and of itself. And you need to guide that transformation within the company. And it may be that if you've done that so well that, that experiences are now embedded inside of every facet of the company, then you can, you know, eliminate your role and say, OK, you know, I'm done. I'll, I'll go on to, to another challenge. Uh, but until then, I think in most companies, the role of a chief experience officer or CXO uh, is is paramount and really shifting into the experience business. When I'm, I've spoken to a few CXOs, and it's really interesting to see where they where they fit or where they are placed within the organization. So, um, what? And what I've been finding is that uh, usually these people struggle somewhere in between operations and sales. Um, and and the, the result is that uh, their influence, their power, their, their, their real ability to create change is quite limited. What is your take on that? You know, how, because we can talk about roles, but how, how do we empower these chief experience officers? Where do they need to be in their in the company? Well, they, they really need to be at the top. I mean, yeah. they need to be yeah. at the same level as other C-levels, you know, reporting to the CEO uh, or a COO, maybe your president. Um, but they need to have that visibility up there. They need, and, and, and generally it is a, one that doesn't have, you know, tons of people out there that they are working through influence, they're, they're, that they have, you know, you know, a center of expertise around experience design, for example, and these other facets. But they really have to work with the rest of the, the organization. In some cases, it may be that because it truly is an experience company, that, that they do have operations reporting. That instead of a chief operations officer, it is the chief experience officer because our operations are exactly. experiences. Yeah, yeah. You know, that would be great where you get to, to that point as well. Somebody, um, I don't know, remember who in uh, one of the previous episodes said that the CEO should be the chief experience officer. What well, that, that, that? That, yeah, well, that if if you're a Walt Disney company, that's absolutely true. Yeah, right? the, the, the chief, the CEO is a chief experience officer, and so you know I like that sentiment because it says basically that we are absolutely. A, a an experience company, so I have to be the chief experience officer because I am the CEO of of an of an experience business. And what have you seen that you know? What what is maybe the biggest mistakes companies can make when they are creating this position of the CXO? Um, what is well, a big they, pitfall? They, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one pitfall is that they they starve it for resources. Um, you know, and, and so they don't, you know, they barely have anybody that they can hire. And so they're not going to, if they don't have their own resources, they're not going to have any influence. Uh, another big pitfall is that they tell somebody, okay, you're the chief experience officer, but they give them no definition. You know, they give them no portfolio. They sort of got to figure it out. That happens so often. That's actually why we wrote this article to say, okay, you know, there is no standard job description. You don't know what it is. Your boss doesn't know what it is. So here is a way to think about it. Think about how you play in each of these roles. Hmm. And it may be that some roles aren't, aren't possible right now. That You focus on one or two of these, and then, and then over time, as you gain that strength, then you can shift into, in, into the other roles. But you know, you, the, you've know you got to figure out what the job entails and what it's all about, and then you can figure out how you can make that work in, in, in your own company. Chief experience officer. Um, if people want to dig further into this topic, what are some recommended resources uh, on this? Well, uh, well, the, the 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 number one resource, of course, is our book, The Experience Economy, uh, and uh, we, it originally came out in 1999, and we have an updated edition that came out in 2011. Uh, maybe we'll be able to do a 20th anniversary edition uh, next year as well. Um, but it really describes all every, you know, most of what we talked about, where things are going, what experiences are, the distinction between services. Uh, it mentions the chief experience offer, but doesn't get into it. So you, so you should look up that article on, and, on um, and the AMA quarterly, again, American Management Association. But it is on our website. Okay. Uh, on our website, we have a, a, a sort of a thinking uh, a tab that gets into what are our latest thoughts. 
And one of those is on the roles of the CXOs. If you're retailers, I got an article on there on the, on the year of retail experiences and all the things that are happening in retail with the bankruptcies and, and so forth. Uh, that's an industry where you really can see that, that you got to be either time well saved or time well spent. And if you're time well saved, you're competing against the, the Amazons and the, and the Walmarts and the Carefors of the world. And so if you've got a physical store, you really better be, be time well spent. So you can catch up on our on our latest ideas there. And it also says where I'm speaking, like at the this master class on customering coming up uh, uh, in a couple of weeks in, in the Netherlands. I'll make sure all the links are in the description for people who want to uh, <laughs> dig further into this topic. Uh, we have two more things in this episode. And one of them is, um, like always, is there a question you'd like to ask us, something that we can think about food for thought? <laughs> Right. So, right. So I would ask you, you know, like, like the question I always love asking businesses is what business are you really in? Uh, I would ask that the same with you. Right. What, what design business are you really in? Are you really in the service design business or are you in the experience design business? And if so, you really need to understand those distinctions. Again, you're going to be able to use what you've learned in service design, but there are new things you've got to focus on. Uh, there are new capabilities that you have. And, and there is a wholly different, distinct economic offering that you need to create if you're truly in the experience design business. But was I supposed to answer the question or just ask it? <laughs> no, the, the question is in which business are you? Leave a comment uh, on this episode and let us know in which business are you. Now it's time for drum roll, uh, Joe. I don't know if you, uh, if you have the book uh, near. I, I, I was looking here, I, I couldn't find a copy. Uh, the Experience Economy. We're, <laughs> we're going to give away a signed copy. It's becoming a tradition here on the show. Um, it's going to, to have your autograph, and maybe an autograph of uh, a second person, I don't know, but the question is related to the second person, right? So. What do people need to answer to win, make a chance to win a copy, a signed copy of the service? Oh gosh, of the experience economy book. <laughs> you better not edit that out, right? I, I want to see I, that. I'll leave everything. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the right, question so, they need to answer? Right, so, the, so the, the question is, right, who is my co-author on the experience economy? I almost said it earlier at the beginning, you know, because he, he actually gave me the term uh, customering. Uh, and uh, you know, so I had to stop that and, and just say uh, co-author that. But who is the co-author in the experience county? You know what? I've been coming to the Netherlands for uh, for 20 years. And I'm usually there, you know, one, two, three times a year for the last 20 years. And uh, I've occasionally had people ask me, does your co-author really exist? Because we never... <laughs> uh. All right, that's, it shouldn't be a hard question. Uh, you've got two weeks, guys, to leave a comment and we'll draw a random winner from the correct answers and uh, notify you. And this is like, you're going to get a real cool, uh, unique example of the experience economy. The only thing left to do for me is to thank you, Joe, for sharing uh, all this. Uh, have, being able to pick your brain, there are so many more questions that I have, uh, but maybe we'll do a sequel. Uh, episode number 100. Who knows? So <laughs> thanks for being okay. on the show, uh, Joe. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to see you again, even if virtually, and to be on the Service Design Show. And by the 100th episode, it will be called the Experience Design Show. <laughs> I'll need to get that URL before somebody else does. <laughs> <laughs> you better work on that, yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing I'm going to do after this episode. Terrific. All right. Thanks. So what is your biggest insight based on what you've heard in this episode? And in which business are you? Leave a comment down below. And if you want to make a chance to win a signed copy of the Service Economy book, let us know who's the co-author. If you know someone who might benefit from what we've just discussed in this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could share this episode with them. And don't forget to sign up for my free course on how to explain service design by clicking here or check the description for more details. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.